Dale and Meshes. Welcome to the world of Baldur's Gate 3. It's me, the Spark King. And in today's video, I want to tell you how to play as a Dark Bush. So what is so special about this character? Today I don't want to give you exact builds, but to tell you how to use this character to his maximum potential. To keep this guide as spoiler-free as possible, it will be split into three parts. Part 1. Character creation tips and what to focus on to get maximum from your character later. Then second part is for those of you who know what is the secret Dark Urge item is. And in the third part I will explain how to use secret Dark Urge ability. So first of all, what is exactly Dark Urge? It's playable origin character, and origin characters get their own story. This character's story is very unique, and I recommend playing through this game at least once as Dark Gorge. It's really interesting. I must discover who I was and what happened to me. So story-wise, it's better to just keep a character as he is instantly. He is Sorcerer and White Dragonborn. But actually you can change class and race to whatever race and class you like. But you can't change your background. So our background is Haunted One, and you will get proficiency in Medicine and Intimidation. Intimidation is Charisma-based proficiency. And while playing as Dark Urge, there's a lot of chances when you can lose your allies for some reason. So my first recommendation will be is to pick any Charisma-based class. And there's four classes actually. Bard, Paladin, Warlock and Sorcerer. My favorite ones is Sorcerer or Warlock. But Paladin can be really strong too. So what about race? While Dragonborn will be a little bit tied to the story, it won't affect anything if you just pick any other race you like. And Dragonborn is one of the weakest races, because they don't have a lot of cool bonuses like other ones. If you're going for Paladin or Bard, especially if you will focus on martial weapons like hammers, swords, etc., I would suggest going for Half Orc. He's really powerful. He can be downed and get up by himself, and you run additional dice when you get a critical hit with melee weapon, so it's definitely melee weapon style. If you want to go into bow style, maybe assassin-like, then try to look for half-elf. They get nice protection from being charmed and you can't be put into sleep. And if you go with wood half-elf sub race, you can get additional movement speed, which is pretty nice buff too. Another good race will be Draw. They feel like a really nice fit for Dark Urge. Or Tieflings. They are really dark and demon-like creatures. If you're going for Sorcerer or Warlock, go with this ability distribution. Get 16 into Charisma, its main spellcasting and your token attribute. Then some Dexterity to 14 and Constitution to 14 to get more armor and health. And at least some points into Wisdom. You can balance out at 14 or stick with 12 into Wisdom and get 10 Intelligence and 10 Strength for really balanced character. This stat distribution will work for Warlock or Sorcerer. If you're going for Paladin, then get higher Strength, its main fighting ability. Then 14 into Charisma, 14 in Constitution, 12 in Wisdom and 12 in Dexterity. If you're going for Bard instead of Paladin, then definitely switch Strength with Dexterity, and you can make this balanced character. Don't stress too much about your oaths if you pick in Paladin, because you probably will lose it and become Oath Breaker anyway. And now it's time to go and find out how we can use these classes with special Dark Urge item. So that's our item. Yeah, this cloak. It's called the Stalker Mantle, and this mantle can be acquired as early as Act 1. Make sure to press long rest from time to time and you will find this out. So what's so special about this cloak? Once per turn, when you kill an enemy, shroud yourself in darkness to become invisible for two turns. That's very cool and powerful ability. And you can utilize it with every class I mentioned. So let's take a talk with them. Most of the time when you play in mages, you are very vulnerable if enemies come close. But not as Dark Urge. Even with low movement speed, you can find out targets that can be killed by your spells. And it's easy to kill with spells as Sorcerer or Warlock. So let's try to land a shot and she's disappeared. But we are right now invisible. 
So to utilize uh, this cloak, all we need to do right now is to just get to another position. After we change position, enemies will try to go to this location and find out where we are. Because we are too far away, they can't find us. So look, Enric trying to find us. He's looking to the right, to the left, to the front, to the back, and there's no us here. And we disappeared from battle, basically. Now we are still invisible, and this works when you're playing solo, of course. If you're playing with your party members, then on your next turn you will just get advantage. Advantage means you will roll two dice, and you will get advantage while attacking from invisibility every time. And that's why when you're playing this type of builds, you want to prioritize spells that uses attack rolls. So, for example, Fireball uses no attack roll. And while it's nice to be invisible and be able to like cast fireballs from invisibility, to maximize potential of your cloak, try to find spells with attack rolls. It could be cantrips too, so Eldritch Blast is cantrips that require attack roll. And as you can see, even on lower level target, I can hit only 80% of the time. That's because I'm too close, so just uh, take a little bit of distance, and of course you will have this distance if you run away on previous turn. Go and unleash all Eldritch Blasts on this target now, with 96% chance. Really easy, with advantage it's easy to hit critical hit, destroy him in one turn and be invisible again. So that's Assassin Mage playstyle, really viable, really powerful. And best spells that require attack roll, in my opinion, is Eldritch Blast in Scorching Ray. Very, very nice spells, because you're doing a lot of spell damage a lot of attack rolls, so getting advantage on them is really nice. But what if you play in Paladin? It works the same and also like magic. Just go in and <laughs> smite down targets. Most of the time when you play in Paladin, you're a mid-shield that everyone sees. But now, just by destroying one enemy with a smite, you become an invisible. And now you're a stealthy assassin. Enemies trying to find you, they will panic. And hitting critical strikes with smite is really powerful. That's why getting advantage from this invisibility is insane. And that's a really nice way to be invisible as paladin and invincible at the same time. And the same playstyle will be with bard. With bard I recommend going for dual-handed crossbows, each in one hand. But for some reason this ability was a little bit bugged and the stalker mental not activating every time. Still, you can use uh, some dual wielding builds. I recommend watching my Stadion video. It's a very nice and powerful build with two daggers in each hand. And now it's time for our third part. So, we will be using this ability, and I will explain how to use it for its max potential. This ability is Slayer Form. The earliest you can get this ability is in Act 2. But only if you're playing as a bad person. If you're trying to be good, Dark Urge, you can get it only in Act 3. So if you get in this early, you will get 98 hit points, which is insane amount. Or still insane amount of 153 hit points at level 10. While in Slayer form, you can't talk or cast spells. You take Dexterity, Constitution and Strength Ability scores as Slayer, and your Intelligence, Wisdom and Charisma will stay. That's one reason why you want to have Wisdom and Charisma based characters as Dark Urge. You will get nice and better saving throws in these two attributes. While in Slayer form, of course. And when Slayer form drops to zero hit points, instead of dying you will be reverted to your normal form. So that's kinda same as Druid form change, but don't treat it like this, because you can use it only once per long rest. Now it's time to just use our Slayer form, and there he is, Slayer. So as you can see, we got really high strength, 14 dexterity, 17 constitution. And our armor class will be 16, so pretty low for our last act of the game, but still you can increase it, if you know how to play this form. As Slayer, you will get Slayer's improved extra attack, and you can do two additional attacks after attacking with your main hand weapon. Your main hand weapon doing already insane amount of damage. And if target is prone, you will be doing critical hits. That's very important information, remember this. If target is bleeding, they are afflicted with Poison Stage 1. Basically, each round, if you hit enemy with your normal attack and he was poisoned, he will try to succeed on saving throws or become super poisoned. But coolest part, if target is bleeding, 
and prone at the same time, your attack not only will be critical hit, but also can inflict this super cool condition. Target will be vulnerable to all damage types. To all damage types. That's super powerful. Vulnerability means uh, target will take double damage from each source. And that's only our main attack. Additionally, Slayer got four additional attacks. So it's multi-attack that doing a lot of attacks in one turn. And it's written as uh, 1d4 plus 1d4 plus 1d4 plus 1d4 plus 4d6. And 4d6 is conditional if target is bleeding and dazed, basically. When he's dazed, you're doing each attack as critical hit. If he's bleeding, you're doing additional 7 slashing damage each hit. So that's really powerful attack. You can do each attack every turn. Now the quest. How to inflict dazed, poisoned, prone conditions. You got it all. So, Blood Boss. 3d10 damage. The target will start to bleed and you will start to regain hit points each turn. Relentless Lunge. You leaping into the air, smashing foils into the ground, possibly knocking them prone. And that's only bonus action. You can do it once per turn. It eats a little bit of movement speed. So while you can use your jump for safety reasons, because uh, jump will just make jump, normal jump. But Relentless Lunge will do a large area of effect around you. And it will inflict damage to all targets. Just look, this bones is unkillable, so we can't destroy them, but every target will take damage, and I will show you in a second. So make sure to use normal jump if you don't want to inflict damage to your allies. And last but not least, let the slaughter begin. That actually should be first ability. You brand nearby creatures with sinister. You marking them and they becoming dazed. And when they die, you gain in plus one bonus to armor class for four turns. So if you see a lot of targets in a battle, that's best ability to start a fight. Then you need to decide how hard it will be for you to sustain damage. So basically, if there's a lot of targets, possibly they pretty weak. Like these goblins, for example. That means we can use Let the Slaughter begin to start a combat, kill few targets, and improve our armor class from 16 to like a lot more. But if there is like few single targets, better start with Blood Boss. It uses action, and uh, big and strong targets will possibly hit you anyway. So being able to hit from 4 to 24 hit points each turn is far more better. Additionally, when target is bleeding, you will inflict poison, and poison will make them harder to hit you. So that's like best way to deal with strong targets. A relentless launch is like must use ability each turn in my opinion. So it uses only bonus action, it's a lot of additional damage and can make targets prone. And when they prone, you just decide what you want to do. Your normal attack, slay or multi-attack. So I guess we can start this fight from this little relentless launch over here. Possibly prone this goblins prone. Let's look on our friend. So they saved, but we get in our bonus action back. And we can try it one more time, for example. This jump made our enemies prone. Don't forget there's a lot of targets, so let the slaughter begin is always a nice way to do some stuff. But they can be saved from let the slaughter begin. So make sure to check your targets. For example, this claw saved, but this goblin not. And he gets this pulse murder's mark on him. He will give us armor class. If you want to hit this target that got affected by let the slaughter begin, use multi attack. Because multi attack screeds when target is dazed. But when target is prone, always use normal attack, slay. Because in this condition, normal attack will do critical strike. So let's see damage on this work companion. He is dazed. And he will <laughs> give us additional armor if we can kill him. As you can see, there is not a lot of damage. Critical hit on 1d4 is basically 2d4, so damage is really laughable and we haven't killed level 2 enemy. That's why I always try to use multi-attack when target is bleeding. So one of our main combinations is blood bus, then multi-attack. If target is prone, that's good, but it's better if he's bleeding. But still, our normal attack doing insane amount of damage, 13 to 43, and we can destroy him with our normal attack instead. Now our armor class should be raised to 17, but that's not forever, because one point of your armor class will be lost each time you avoid an attack. 
So in my opinion, basic and best combination will be just to use relentless lunge and try to make your targets prone. So let's try this out. Not lucky this time, if no target is prone, try to use your blood bus and possibly make target bleed. So again, saved. If you're not inflicting any conditions, just use your normal attacks. Don't forget you can use three of those. And your normal attacks is incredibly powerful. But if you're lucky and targets is prone, then you will do even more damage with your normal attacks. Coolest part uh, is that you can't talk and you will apply a lot of interest to your person when you're going into like different places. Everyone will go and try to see what you're doing, who are you. It can be disadvantage or advantage depending on the situation. So if you just want to ignore some dialects, uh, go into player form and you won't get involved in them basically. But sometimes you will be involved in combat. If it's hard to target creatures with a lunge, just make sure to go into tactical view from top down. Now it's easier to strike two targets at the same time and possibly make them prone. Like this one. And look at the damage. It's just insane. 12 d6 slashing damage. If you're using short rest, you replenish your health. So if you want to be in a slayer form as long as possible, don't forget to use short rests to heal yourself. Potions is also viable too. Make sure not to ever start your fight with attack from Slayer, because you will use your action and won't be able to do three attacks in a turn. Jump and normal attack on prone targets. If targets is not dazed, don't even try to use multi attack, so normal attack once more and normal attacks once more. That's how you play Slayer. That's really powerful style. A lot of disables and damage amplifiers, and basically ability to destroy targets in one turn. But if for some reason you will be destroyed in your Slayer form, don't worry. You will get back to your normal form immediately with full health, and can continue your stealthy Dark Rush play style while destroying enemies and getting away invisible. And then rinse and repeat as much as you want. I hope you enjoyed this guide. Make sure to drop a like and comment on this video for more guides like this. I'm planning to make Moondroid and Oathbreaker soon, but leave your ideas and suggestions in the comments. See you in the next videos, guys.